Okay, my persistence in looking for bark has paid off because I have found some outstanding, outstanding material. And hope we can see here that uh, back of this fine knife that Nick Skinner built for me, um, it's about an eighth of an inch right at the uh, at the pewter, and this bark's actually thicker. It's thicker than the back side of that blade, and it's extremely flexible. So that's going to be a great covering for the canoe. So in preparation for the next phase, and that's getting the bark laid out uh, on the building platform, I had to move my gunnels, so I've uh, given up part of my front porch to do that, and I've got them all, all weighted down, and uh, I've got the shear line that I was looking for, and we're on, off to the next step now, but a wee bit of history. So the canoes, like, like everything, although the, the, when one looks at a canoe, they all sort of look the same. Birch bark canoe is a birch bark canoe, but that wasn't the case. In fact, every every nation's canoe was different. So an Ojibwe is different than an Algonquin is different than a than an Iroquois. And over time, due to European uh, encroachment, more and more natives were forced closer off their territorial lands, and they'd start to adapt certain things that they liked about other other people's canoes, if you would. But the one thing that stayed the same for the most part was the bow and the stern. So a long nose Ojibwe um, is a distinct shape. Uh, the old style Algonquin is a distinct shape. I'm building a, uh, an Algonquin canoe that did change somewhat in the bow and stern. So this canoe would, would be a reproduction of a canoe that would date into the 1800s, not the 1700s. The, uh, we think about the fur trade canoes and the long, the really high stems. Well. That wasn't done um, for aesthetics. It was done for a purpose. They, the voyageurs paddled for hours, countless hours, and they slept for five, six hours a night, often starting in the dark, didn't stop for breakfast or their first food, if you would, until roughly 10 in the morning, taking advantage of the fact that in the morning there was calm weather so they could make more miles. But those really high stems that you see in the Montreal canoes and the North canoes, they were designed so that they didn't have to build shelter. So by laying the canoe over on one gunnel and onto those uh, stem and stern pieces, they essentially made a shelter that they could get their upper torso underneath. They'd roll a piece of birch bark over their leg and that was home. Uh, Anyway, the, uh, back to the shape of this one. So it, it's going to have quite a bit of shear, as I explained. It's going to have quite a bit of rocker. And this part's done. So I'm off to the build a few more parts. I'm back to the manufacturing business. Okay. Last piece, so those are my going to be my outer stakes that are going to essentially uh, delineate the curve, if you would, of the outside of the canoe. So the next thing I've got to do, I made 20 of them, so I'll have 10 down each side, and I'll be putting battens in that'll keep my bark smooth as I'm stitching it. Anyway, those 20 are done, and uh, I've got to make 20 uh, inner stakes. And yet another 20 pieces finished. So those thin little guys with the curve I've got here, they're gonna go on the inside of the bark and they'll go against my building frame like so. And again, that's gonna help keep that nice smooth line uh, as the canoe transitions both up and in at the bow and stern. So 20 more pieces done. And next up is, uh, is wooden pegs, square pegs for round holes. I believe that's probably the last one I'm going to need. So what I've essentially done here is I'm, I'm making a, a, a tapered 
wooden square peg, but it's tapered from one end to the other. And it's a real subtle taper because when I drive it between the two gunnels or putting the top caps in, I want it to have contact with all the wood. So if the taper's too, too thick, uh, I'll only hold on the inside part or the outside part, I should say, and it won't actually have enough friction on the inside of the gunnel. So yeah, taper from one end to end, square, and I think I got enough. <laughs> I got about a hundred of those little things whittled out and that was rather tedious. Anyway, on to the next job. So what I'm doing now is I've, I've got one, I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a minute. I've got one stem piece done back here and bent on a jig that I built. And I had them both done but I kind of messed up on the first one and I'll show you how in a sec. But so what I'm doing is making the next stem piece. So, and you can see the profile of this. So this will go on the inside of the canoe at the front or the rear and the taper allows for the bark to come in like so and that's where it's going to get stitched uh, once this is bent into the shape that I desire and I've almost got this guy I've almost got him where I want him and hopefully I don't screw up a second time that should work so what I've done here is I've, I've built a jig uh, for the stem piece and, I, and that's what the second piece is for. So my first attempt was, uh, yeah, sometimes I'm not the brightest uh, candle in the candle holder because I, I got this all done. It split out pretty nice. Uh, I was pretty pleased with that. And then I put it in the frame, poured boiling water over it, got it stem just uh, or bent just like the one you see here, and then realized I had it mirror image. So instead of having the skinnier part, to the outside of the canoe, which should be there, and the inside of the canoe this direction, I put it in backwards. So I was asked, why don't you just pour boiling water over that and bend it back again? So almost 180 degrees. Anyway, that, that piece is a bunch of kindling. And uh, I'm gonna see if I can make one more here. What I'm doing at this point is I'm putting it, I'm uh, tying off the one end that's gonna be on the inside bottom of the canoe. Because when I split this guy down from the top, by doing this, I'll stop the split from going all the way through because I want this piece, I want this portion to be solid and I want this split into ideally uh, about eight pieces, but I'll settle for six. And sometimes in the process of splitting it out, um, uh, they'll, they'll split out on me and I start all over again. So yeah, I've, I've sometimes had to make four or five before I, I, I get two good ones, but hopefully this is a pretty straight grain piece and I think it's going to work out pretty good. Probably said this a hundred times, but when you're splitting any wood, it's splitting it in halves. So we're going to start by uh, finding roughly the center of this guy. And we're going to hopefully get six to eight strips out of it. And as I split it down, it's going to stop at my tie-off point. If it starts to run off, you can put pressure on the thicker part and a little bend and ideally bring it back to a uh, to center. There we go. Now I'm going to use a thinner blade for the next split. So again I've got two halves so now I'm going to split them in half.
Okay, so you saw me try to bend that at the start, and now you can see how easily that's going to bend, especially once I put boiling water on it, and that turned out pretty good. I'd like to get one more split in that guy, but it's not going to have much of a bend up here, and it's thin at the bottom, so where the biggest part of the bend is going to be, so I'm not going to mess with that. So I was hoping for eight, I got uh, four, I got seven. Seven will do it just fine. Just when you think you're done making all the parts, I need some more tools. So I got to make a number of clothespins and basically they allow me to do the stem pieces. So I got six done. That'll give me three clothespins for the stern and the bow. So once I get the bark uh, heated and bent up, these will temporarily hold the bark pinched together where we're going to get that fine point of the canoe. Uh, it'll also help keep the, uh, once I put the stem pieces in, stem piece will go inside that and it allows me to line it up using some form of string line or a straight stick with the, with the one at the other end of the canoe so I don't end up with the, them looking like this, I end up with them in line. So yeah, six more tools. So I mentioned at the onset of this uh, canoe build that I was trying to do something different with the gunnels. Well, I'm doing something different with the building frame. So typically I would make these out of, of bending uh, long pieces of cedar and putting cross pieces on them, and that would be my building frame. So, but I thought I'd try using a, some rough sawn pine plank, and I've smoothed it out as best I could here. Now that's going to sit down on, on the bark like so, and it, it looks small, but um, the, the design of this canoe it's almost diamond shaped if you would, but the bow and stern are actually going to be about six inches um, either way of the points that you see. Uh, anyway, the next point at this point, I got it marked out. I'm going to drill some new holes for my outer outer stakes before I beat the bark. Next step will be bringing the bark in. By the time I'm done, building platforms over eight years because you're building different canoes, different shapes, different widths. So I got to put a series of new holes for my outer stakes, and uh, I'll demonstrate this. So I need approximately 10 holes. I may have to get more. And some of these are going to have to get whittled down. But I visualize that as my outside stake. This will come clear when I actually get the bark laid out, but just for demonstration. So I got one flat side That'll go in here and inside the bark. Well, let's use this hole as an example Bark's going to get bent up over the building platform like that and then my inner stake which has a round shape to the bottom Gets pushed in against the building frame like that with the bark pinched here and then I'm going to use twine to hold these together so what I'm using here is a building frame. Typically, um, natives initially built them on a flat area of ground that had often sand. And they'd flatten it impeccably so that, that the, you know, they had the building frame that they, building platform that they wanted. It was the French that decided it's much more ergonomic to, to get it up off the, off the ground. So they would build plank building platforms. So by the time I'm done, this is going to look like a piece of Swiss cheese. So when you think about when, when we harvested this, the, the, the white side was out and the, and the inner bark was in, obviously. Um, so when we took it off the tree, we, there's no way you can roll such thick bark right off the tree opposite. So we're turning it literally like taking a sock off and putting it on the other way. So 
we had to soak it in the lake by the area we harvested it in and uh, then we're able to s gradually flatten it and get it rolled in this direction so now i got to get some boiling water going because we want to uh, get it pliable and that's what the water does to it and then we're going to get this rolled out we're going to pick the best section uh, cut off the surplus and uh, yeah on goes the building frame <laughs> The bark uh, on a birch tree is like a laminate and all I'm doing now is just cleaning up some of the loose stuff um, and trying to select where's the best place to cut it for the for the canoe build. You, you don't want to take too much because you're just weakening it and I know this doesn't look pretty now but we're not going to see any of this so so we're being pretty careful here. We don't want to take um, any more than necessary. Okay, this, this may look a little excessive here with the rocks, but it, it's twofold. Um, and there is method to my madness. Number one is I want to get a nice flat bottom in the canoe. So I've put a lot of weight on here, which has flattened out that bark with the hot water. And the next thing I'm going to do is take this beautiful piece of bark and I'm going to cut cracks in it. And I'm going to cut it all to pieces. So here we've got a natural blemish. Um, what they're called is gores. So if you look along the canoe uh, going forward, you see all these buckles we've got here. So what's happening, uh, we're taking a canoe that's this wide in the middle to a, an actual point at either end. So it wants to buckle. So the method they use is, is it's called cutting gores. So we're gonna cut a crack from where it's gonna bend at the bottom of the uh, building frame to the outside. And as they're folded up, they're gonna overlap. And then afterwards, I'm gonna cut out sort of a, if you visualize a straight, cut I'm going to make and when it's folded up that this part's going to overlap this part then I'm going to cut that V out and they're just going to either get slightly overlaid or a lot of the builders um, the dif different native uh, nations would actually just butt joint them so I haven't decided on which way I'm going to go there but the first thing I'm looking for is natural um, uh, faults if you would in the bark and I've got one here so that's that's my first gore and mother nature did that for me it came right off the tree that way so as I come down the canoe there's no there's no real math to this 
and they don't have to be symmetrical. So one side can be have a gore in a slightly different spot than the other. But because I've got a fairly gentle curve here, I'm going to put a gore in, and the bark's pretty good, I'm going to put a gore in right here. So there's the first one. And the next one, I've got a natural one here again. This needs a little persuasion here. And I'm just going to leave that in for now and work my way back. So if I go approximately equal distance on this side, it should give me that bend I need as the canoe starts to come around. So I've got a bad spot on the bark here. These are called cat eyes. For example, here's a cat eye. So as the tree grew, these are old branch unions. And uh, as the tree grows the, its canopy in a large woodlot, it gets shaded. And those lower limbs will not get enough sunlight. They won't get foliated. Eventually they die. They slough off and the tree compartmentalizes that wound and it forms what we call a cat eye. So we're going to put the Nyx gore in right about there. The trick to cutting bark is to cut it on about a 45 degree angle. If you try to cut it straight, uh, you're going to have a lot of trouble, but it, it does cut pretty good with a sharp knife if you cut it on about a 45 to a 60 degree angle. And you can see as I raise these pieces, you can see how this, this one's overlapping this one. Well, that small piece of bark will get cut out later when we try to butt those, those gores up. So I've got a natural one here, which I wish I didn't have, because it's not where I want it. Ideally, I'd like a gore somewhere in here, but... I think we're... Yeah, and if I cut through here, I've got a big cat eye here as well, which is going to be problematic. So... What to do? I'll leave that for a while and think on it. I'll go to the other side. Once again, I'm going to give a shout out to Nick Skinner out there in Nova Scotia, who is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best knife makers in Canada. And uh, yeah, he made that little guy, and it's just sharp. You can shave with that guy. Okay, I'm going to leave cutting this score because it, it may it may fold up for me. Um, so I'm going to start getting my stakes in, and if I'm having trouble, I may have to put a, a gore in here. It may not have to be a full gore. It might be a part one. Anyway, my only problem remains this guy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, nobody's perfect, including Mother Nature, I guess, so we'll have to work around that somehow.
of some kind of thick bark. lined up pretty much dead center. So what I'm doing here is, because I want some rocker in this canoe, and it's going to have much more, but I want to start that rocker and try to give the bark some memory here so that when it comes to driving the ribs in, obviously it's not going to be flat bottomed anymore, it's going to be rounded, round shape. Uh, this will give me that rocker from end to end, so that's what we're looking for. The other thing is, the only major issue in this entire piece of bark was this guy. I'm not sure what I'm going to do there. I, I may end up having to put a patch on that, but I don't know yet where my shear line comes. So, so depending on where my gunnels come, it does have quite an upsweep. So, so I may be able to cut below that, which would be ideal. So we'll have to wait and see. That's, uh, that's a ways down the road. So where I'm at now is the, um, uh, I got to eat more boiling water. Yeah, more boiling water on this. Get this bent and get my clothespins on it. Once that's done, I'm going to be putting battens along the sides uh, in different positions. And then these guys are going to get tied in together uh, as we progress along once the battens are in place. And that's going to give me a, a nice smooth line on the outside of the canoe. And then the, the, the next step before I can sew on my side panels is I got to get inner stakes in, which are going to get tied to the inside of the outer stake. So uh, yeah, it's starting to look like a, a rather agitated porcupine, but it's coming together. These stem pieces are, they're not finished by any means. So what happens um, once I've got them in, in shape here, sort of near the end of the process, uh, once I've got my gunnels laced in, is so I'm gonna put in my stem pieces. And the stem pieces will dictate how I cut this off. So. Right now it's just a, a crude sort of a shape, but I am keeping my center line going here, so it should all should all come together. Okay, I've finished cutting out this gore, and you can see how I've, I've flush mounted that. And uh, there's, there's the triangular piece that I took out of it. So I have to do that at every one of my gores, cut out that little triangular piece, and the next step is putting in the battens.
what I'm doing now is I've got the uh, I've got two more st inner stakes to do, and and I've put my battens in. So what I'm trying to do is get a a really smooth line along here, so I can put my side panels in. So this one's not going to require much. It was a pretty big tree, so the side panels um, compensate for the. It's obviously wider in the middle, so my tree uses up more bark in the middle than it does at the ends. So I've got to add a, a piece on, on the side here. It's called a side panel. And I, I want this a nice, smooth, curved line. And uh, so I put out the inner battens in against the building frame, tie them to the outer battens. And at some point, once I get the, um, the basic outline done, the side panels in, then I'm going to bring my, my gunnels in. They get set, set in and then these these co corresponding side panels will get tied together at the right width and then I can sew on my gunnels, the inner and outer gunnels.